Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordor and Glory video. In today's episode, we shall be looking at more dispatches from the front lines. That's right, it's time for another tournament after action report. And let me tell you, I've got a spicy meatball for your viewing pleasure today. The army that I took to the event was possibly the craziest concoction that I have ever dared to take into the meta. It has super heavy tanks, ogrins in chimeras, and Colonel Iron Hand Strachan. I know that sounds like a total disaster, a car crash of an army list. But let me tell you, it wasn't. And with that foreshadowing getting us hyped up for today's video, let's not mess around anymore. Let's rip off the band-aid, lift up the rock, have a look underneath, and dive right into today's episode. So, as is tradition, I want to start off by saying a few thank yous. Firstly, I want to say a big thank you to Just Play Games in Liverpool for running the event. For those of you who have watched a few of my tournament reports now, you'll be familiar with Just Play, and they always put on a great show. The tournament was really well organised, pairings, lists, the whole nine yards, no issues whatsoever, and they also have a great shop, so you can buy goodies after the tournament if you've done well, or treat yourself if you need a bit of commiseration, more having to make yourself feel better, and the staff is always really fun and knowledgeable, and the best bit, they sell lots of food and drink as well, which helps you keep fully stocked throughout the day. I've never had a bad experience at a Just Play Tournament. They're always really, really tight, really well run. And so I just want to say a big thank you to them. I also want to say a big thank you to all of my opponents as well. Every single one of them, we had Will, Jason and Paul, were all top blokes everyone was really nice there were no gotchas it was always players intended and overall they made for a fantastic tour experience because all the games were just fun and that always comes down to the other person that's standing opposite you on the table but with all of that said now let's get into the video proper and we'll start off with the army list First thing I want to mention, this is going to be a brief overview of the army because I've actually done a separate video covering it line by line, step by step in detail. And I'll make sure that that video is down in the description. But I'm going to just explain what the hell this thing is that you're seeing in front of you because it's a completely bonkers concoction. It's out of the warp. It is madness. This is not a meta list. This is a meme list. And the reason that it's a meme list is because I did not make it. This came from the Ogryn think tank that is my live stream chat. You see, as I've been going to more tournaments, I've been wanting to involve my community more and more. Not only do I want to make content that I'm going to enjoy, but I want to make content that you guys want to see. And so I did a live stream where I said, chat, build me a list. And this is what they came up with. Jesus Christ. Uh, what? What faction should I date? It's like shouting at you guys. Ooh. Paul Dunn. Gentlemen, I am proud to announce that our first unit in the list and our first super heavy is going to be the Mighty Shadow Sword. Honestly, I think they just wanted to see big tanks. What can the super heavies do in a tournament? And that's fair play. But it wasn't a total just nothingness. It wasn't like there was no thought that went into it. Chat did listen to me slightly. I was able to impress upon them that we needed to make something that was at least semi-functioning. And this is what they came up with. Start off, we have got two super heavies. A Bane Blade and a Shadow Sword. The Bane Blade is kind of there just as the Jack of All Trades, Master of Non Super Heavy. It's got a bit of a swingy cannon, but at the end of the day, whatever you point a Bane Blade at, it's going to take some damage. The Shadow Sword is the real star of the show. That thing has such an incredible damage output, and it's a little bit of a sleeper considering its points cost. I think most people, when they see a Bane Blade, they know what that does. So they instinctively sort of target the Bane Blade, but 
that's a bit of a mistake because the Shadow Sword, as you'll hear, turned out to be very, very interesting. We've got two Super Heavies and then we have got a Rogal Dawn. Interestingly, I did give chat the option of me taking a third Super Heavy, which was a Hellhammer, but big sad for the old Hellhammer. Uh, chat was like, nah, that's so terrible. We don't even want to see it on the battlefield. I know, F in the chat, boys. F in the comment section. So the Hellhammer got passed over in favour for the Rogal Dawn. Rogal Dawn essentially taking the spot of the third heavy tank. To support those, we have Supreme Command Blob. That's where you take the Lord Solar Platoon Command Squad, add it onto a unit of Catachans, and now the Lord Solar can do 24 inch orders. And then we had two regimental engineers. Primarily, they're going to run around with the Super Heavies, giving them a 4 plus invulnerable save and repairing any damage that does somehow get through. A 2 plus save, toughness 13, and a 4 plus invulnerable. Uh, after that, we have a five-man squad of Scions. Really, they're just to drop in and do some objectives. But I do want to do a little community shout-out. I want to say a big shout-out to Commissar Tex, who very much wanted me to take a Commissar model in this army. Sadly, chat wouldn't give it to him, but I did compromise with chat. And so to represent the Tempesta who leads the squad, we've got what I like to call like a junior commissar with a power fist. He's, he's learning on the job and the sounds are kind of there to guide him on his way. A little bit of a scholar progenium fraternity working together, as it were. Also, special community shout out to Cosmic Drew, who made the custom Lord Solar model, the Mordy Mobile. Basically, the Pope Mobile in space, completely made out of custom, uh, out of GW parts, but is also the right size and dimensions. So it's totally legit as a tournament model. And the TOs and none of the players had any issues with me using it. In fact, it got a lot of compliments. So big thank you to Cosmic Drew for sending, for literally building and sending me that model just to support the channel. Thank you so much. So after we've got the Scions led by Commissar Tex and we've got the Morning Mobile from Cosmic Drew, we have got the two Ogryn squads in the Chimeras. These are the Daka Chimeras. They are surprisingly good. The thing is, when you get within nine inches, each Ogryn can fire six shots and two of them can fire out the top hatch. So you've got the two heavy bolters plus the two rapid fire ripper guns, meaning that each one of these is putting out the equivalent of 18 heavy bolter shots. It's very tasty. And then when the Chimera dies and the Ogryn get out, well, now the third Ogryn can shoot, so you're still getting those 18 punchy shots. The idea behind these things was to be like a secondary target for any orders the Lord Solar might be throwing out if one of the big boys goes down, but also to add some genuine Daka and for me to have some way of punching people off objectives. The Ogryn can drive up, they can jump out, the Chimera can shoot, the Ogryn can shoot, the Ogryn can then charge, they're half decent in combat, they're fragile, but they can storm a point if they need to. Finally, we have got the Katachan combat blob, led by none other than Colonel Ironhand Strachan. This guy is an absolute beast. I fell in love with him at the end of 9th edition. My sordid daddy issues love affair with Strachan is well documented at this point. And Strachan plus Katachans, not only did it give me some proper combat punch, but also it meant that I had some actual bodies. Because apart from this blob, there's almost no infantry in the list. I barely even count the Supreme Command blob. It's really there just to support the super heavies. So Strachan and his boys were the only real OC that I had and the only proper combat as well. But that's a brief overview of the list. The general strategy was to try and distract people with the Bane Blades, try and dominate the firefights, hope that these big tanks could really absorb the punch. And whilst there's this huge maelstrom just going on and these big units battering each other, how my infantry and my ogres kind of run around and be a bit sneaky and take the objectives. I also kind of wanted to try out the whole idea of force concentration. It's not something that guard often do. We're more of a combat width army. We spread our army across the entire deployment zone and we push forward at multiple points and we hope that the enemy spreads themselves too thin and we can kind of overwhelm them everywhere. That's what I call combat width. But what this army does, it's very elite. It's very few models. And whilst these models are big, I'm hoping that I can kind of completely dominate one objective 
move something on to hold it and then completely dominate a second objective in the latter half of the game and move something on to that. So I'm playing for three out of five objectives with this army rather than going for I'm taking all of the points all of the time with my waves of infantry. There's a very different play style, but it does have a hell of a lot of firepower. At the end of the day, I can just fall back on the tried and tested technique of if I kill all of my opponent's models, then they can't score any points. But that covers the army list. But what about the tournament? What was the lay of the land? How spicy was this thing? What was the terrain like? First thing to mention is that it was a one day, three round event. And it was a midweek one which is strange. I've never been to a midweek tournament before. I've read all about them. I've seen many other people go to them. And the impression that I get is that they fall one of two ways. Either it's total seal clubbing or it's very sweaty. There's a lot of good players that go there because either you've got people who just happen to be free midweek and so they end up just toddling along and having a good time. Or you've got people who are taking tournaments quite seriously and therefore they're going to midweek ones. I found with this one that it wasn't a total sweat box, but all of the players there had tournament experience. I would describe it as a semi-competitive event. Definitely not seal clubbing whatsoever. When you see the armies that I played against, you'll understand that no one was running anything that was unmeta. I mean, I probably had on paper the worst list there by far. There was Eldar, there were Necrons, there were Death Guard, there was Chaos Space Marines. I think there was even Votan knocking around. There was one of the Guard player as well, and he had a much better list than mine. He had artillery and he had tanks, he had infantry. So no one at the event had a bad list. And so I would say that it was a semi-competitive event. But fortunately, even though everyone was taking it seriously, like I said at the beginning of the video, everyone was really nice. As for the terrain, well, Just Play does things a little bit differently. A lot of events in the UK use what we call WTC or UKTC standard terrain. This is incredibly dense. It's all ruins all the way and you can't move anything bigger than an infantryman around with ease. Even small vehicles tend to have to follow predetermined paths and larger vehicles like Land Raiders or Rogal Dawns can't even get out of their deployment zones more often than not. Lima Russes can struggle. It's way too dense. Just play has a lot of ruins, but I would describe their terrain as 66% ruins and 33% other stuff. That's forests and craters and battlefield debris. They make sure that there's always enough of a gap that you can move a super heavy around the board. It might not be easy, but you can. So they always avoid there being a situation where a unit gets trapped in the deployment zone. That was obviously a massive help for me. If I had taken this list with the two Super Heavies in the Dawn to something using like UKTC terrain, like LGT, or if I'd taken it to an event with WTC terrain, something that was much denser, something from the Shadows of 9th edition, then I literally couldn't have won a game. I couldn't have moved the vast majority of the points in my army out of my deployment zone. As it was, I was able to move around the board with the Super Heavies, but... I didn't always get the angles that I wanted. The terrain was still dense enough to make it tricky. My opponent could often feed me units if they wanted to, but at least there was always at least one path that I could take so my big boys could move around. But now we get to the bit that you've all been waiting for, the games. And of course, naturally, sir, we shall start off with game number one. And this was against... Will and his Death Guard. Now, Will is actually someone that I know in real life. We have played against each other many times at events. We always seem to get paired into each other. And he always has Death Guard. He loves his Death Guard. There is main army. I think every event I've ever seen him at, he's running the Smelly Invaders. And today 
was, of course, no exception. I should mention that Will has actually recently started up a YouTube channel called The Disgustingly Resilient Podcast. Highly recommend that you check it out if you're a Death Guard fan. I'll do my best to link it down in the description, but if my Ogun brain strikes and I forget, please just type it in, Disgusting Resilient Podcast, and it should come up no problem. Now, Will was running a pretty cool Death Guard list. I think it's slightly off meta, but when I was chatting to him about it, he said he just wanted to try a few things out. And he thought it looked good on paper, but he was kind of using the RTT as a test bed, which is a good way of doing it. So to begin with, he had Mortarion. Wow, bring in the big boy. Yeah, not messing around. That's a statement right there. He then had a unit of Plague Marines, and then he had one, two, three more. So in total, four squads of Plague Marines, all with the usual accoutrement of free weapons. Lots of heavy Plague Weapons and Plague Spewers and Plasma Guns and all that kind of good stuff. He then had 10 Death Guard Cultists, and I feel like they were kind of there to just set objectives and screen out and do things that Chaff Infantry do. We then had three... Death Guard Predator Destructors. These have got the Lance Cannon Sponsons and the Auto Cannon Turret. And then two Fetid Bloat Drones with the Flesh Mower and two Death Guard Rhinos. Rounding the list out, we had some allies. There were a squad of Beasts of Nurgle, two units of Nurglings, and three War Dog Carnivores with the Havoc Multi Launcher. Reaper Chain Talon and Slaughter Claw each. So the mission for this engagement was Scorched Earth. That means there's five objectives, one in the center, one in each table quarter. The thing about Scorched Earth is you only need to control two objectives to get the maximum primary each turn. But your opponent can start, or you I suppose, can start destroying the objectives. If you do, you get a bit of a temporary bonus, a bit of a boost to your overall score, but you have to start burning the objective and then your opponent gets a turn to try and stop you, so it's a bit of a risky maneuver. The deployment was search and destroy, essentially table quarters with the big circle exclusion zone in the middle, and the mission rule was sweep and clear, so you control an objective even if you're not on it, as long as you got someone on it in the first place. It's a very convoluted way of me saying it was sticky objectives. For my deployment, I decided to put my Shadow Sword on the left flank, the northern side, as it were, and then I'd have my Bane Blade in the center. Now, the reason the Shadow Sword went up north was because that was the clearest pathway I had around the map, and I figured that I wanted to use the long-range firepower of this thing to start picking off predators and rhinos and other various vehicles. I want to win that armor clash quickly. But there wasn't a lot of enemy units up there to begin with, so it was quite a safe place for the Shadow Sword to go. The Bane Blade, which I considered by far to be the more expendable Super Heavy, which is an unusual feeling, but this list is an unusual list, that went slap bang in the middle. Because it could take the punch, but if it died, I wasn't going to be overly upset. Finally, the dawn went down in the south. Again, relatively little enemy activity there to start with. And it should allow the dawn to be able to pop some shots off from a safe distance and start sneaking around the flank a little bit. I know, a sneaky dawn! I keep telling you, it's a strange list. We had a couple of chimeras interspersed between the other big tanks and then Strachan and his mob went bang in the middle with the Bane Blade. The idea being that those two quite potent units could push forward into the center and start making things happen. But again, if the Catachans die, I can use 2CP and they get to come back. We'll put Mortarion bang in the center as well. And then he put his Predators kind of further back in his deployment zone. I think he was concerned that the Shadow Sword would destroy them. That was a valid concern, to say the least. But also, he wanted to make sure that he had the drop on me. There's no point in deploying your armor all exposed, like I did, unless you haven't got a choice. So he had his units quite well hidden. He also had a Rhino with a bunch of Plague Marines 
uh, towards his uh, sort of back of his deployment zone so he could scoot them over onto the objective that from the guard perspective was in the top left and they had another rhino and a plague drone doing the same thing so we could start pushing people down onto the objective in what would be from the guard perspective again the bottom right the knight stayed off the knight carnivore stayed off i think that was a smart move there was a limited amount of places you could hide and be on the front as well mortarian clearly being the demon primarch he, he takes precedence he's gonna take the primary spot and as a result his pathetic imperial i should say imperial chaos knight allies were put into reserve to protect them from to protect their their little, little fragile little hides as it were also it meant that he could outflank them and start threatening me and that if i wasn't careful and I didn't screen him out. He could start getting to my back lines. And I'm telling you now, Lord Solar, Leontus, the Morning Mobile, he's a big deal, but he's not going to beat a, <laughs> a Night Carnivore in combat. So it was quite a clever move because it did mean that I couldn't push everything that I wanted forward just straight away from the beginning. And it helped protect some pretty important assets in the Death Guard army. We then get to the all-important roll-off for turn one and Will wins it. And I don't think that he wanted it. Because it meant that if I had gone first, I couldn't see anything of his army, really. So I couldn't kill anything. But if he goes first, sure, he gets kind of the advantage to score some points. But then I get to shoot him. And my army wants to shoot him. In the end, he plays it very conservatively. He doesn't bring his predators out to play. Makes me very sad. And instead, he takes a rhino full of plague marines moves them over to the southern objective and he does the same thing in the northern objective he and he has a plague drone that's going towards the south objective as well he can't really see me with very much some pot shots come out but don't do any damage the plague marines jump out but they can't quite get onto the objective and one unit of plague marines does stay inside of the rhino so there's one in the rhino in the southern objective one out the rhino on the southern objective a bloat drone near the southern objective and then you've got a knight carnivore which i think he also actually didn't put in reserve that went on the southern objective and then on the northern objective you've just got the one rhino with plague marines that's moved and advanced it can't quite get on the northern objective but it's getting there turn two Mortarion and friends stay in the middle but out of line of sight behind those big L's and so that's Will's turn comes over to the guard and I'm like okay so I don't have a huge amount of targets here but I'm pretty confident I can kill what I can see so the Rogal Dawn pooters over and starts trying to put firepower into the night carnivore I have to admit, I massively overestimated what the Dawn could do. I just figured that the Oppressor Cannon would just blow away a Night Carnivore easy peasy. I mean, it's flat damage three. But honestly, it completely whiffed. Between the Oppressor Cannon and all of the other Daka, I think I brought the Knight down to five or six wounds. I didn't destroy it and I didn't degrade it or anything like that. It was still pretty healthy. So that was a bit of a disappointment. And it did mean that Will would control that objective, which is unfortunate because he'll get the, the primary for it. Elsewhere, though, we did do a good job. The Shadow Sword drove forward a bit, drew line of sight to uh, the Rhino and deleted it. And then the Bane Blade picked up two squads of Plague Marines, except I think there were, there were maybe one or two left. But the Bane Blade picked up the majority of the Plague Marines. And so the only thing that was left from Will's Southern Push was the Bloat Drone, an injured Knight, and one or two Plague Marines. So we'd done some damage, but not a huge amount. Turn 1 was relatively bloodless. As for my attempts to take objectives, Strachan and the boys moved, moved, and moved, and advanced onto the middle objective, and the Bane Blade actually went up there with them. So the Bane Blade was able to put its AOC toe onto the objective. That was a lot of objective control sat on that middle objective. And I was kind of expecting Will to take it off me with Mortarium and the Bloat Drone. But if he did, 
I was like, right, Shadow Sword, Rogal Dawn, Bane Blade. I'm just going to blow Mortarium and whatever else goes into the middle back to the Stone Age. And then the middle is pretty securely in my hands. So I actually didn't mind if he went for me. I faced Mortarium before. He didn't do a lot of damage in combat to vehicles. And that was against a Rogal Dawn. And I was kind of confident that the Bane Blade could stand up to it even more than the Dawn. So I was confident that I might be able to hold the middle. At the very least, it would bait the big boy out. But that didn't happen. Goes over to Will's turn two and he thinks... He sort of measures it out. Can he get round? Because Motarian's sort of struggling to get round with... He can fly, but he's it's not great going up and over and all this kind of stuff. So he has to go round the big L shape. And he measures it out and he goes, you know what? I don't think I I get there very reliably. And I don't think I can get Mortarion and the drone into the Kachan. So I don't think I take that off of this turn. So what he does is he sets himself up. He sort of wiggles Mortarion a bit, wiggles the bloat drone a bit. Um, and he gets them into position where next turn they'll be able to easily move round and take on the Katachans and stuff. But this turn he's letting me have it. Which was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one because that means I'm going to get some more primary points. Down in La South, it goes a bit squiffy for me. I'm not going to lie. The Predator Train comes out and unleashes Laz and Auto Death onto the Rogal Dawn. I'm pretty confident. Rogal Dawn's T12, it's got a blade to plating. I can pop smoke. Yeah, it's all going gravy, right? My smoke proceeds to do nothing. And I can't roll a save to save my life. Or the Dawn's life. And so the Dawn is reduced to like four wounds. And it uses a blade of armor. And then the carnivore that the Dawn had failed to kill. Because it rolled a one on the oppressor cannon's number of shots. Comes out and just munches it. And so I lose the Dawn, and the Dawn killed nothing in this game. Not a, not a good trade, boys. Not a good trade, to say the least. But the Predator Train is out, and so is the Night Carnivore. So I've got some ways and means. At least I've got some more targets. But what was really frustrating is in the north, damn, damn... Will and his cunning tactics and him being actually a good player. <laughs> so what happens in the north, the Rhino deposits the Plague Marines onto the objective. They're happy to sit there. And then it just moves in and like moves blocks me. Like what? It's bloody moves blocked me. Absolutely unacceptable behavior. Using tactics against me. He's no honor. No honor, I say. I'm, I am, I'm saying this hoping that Will hears it and knows that I am joking. So the Rhino just move blocks me. And I'm like, oh, brilliant. Good times for me, I guess. And one of the night carnivores comes on in the north as well. But it doesn't quite... It doesn't make its charge. So it's kind of sat out there a little bit exposed, which is not a great position for it to be in. And then another night carnivore comes on from the south. So I'm like, oh, bloody hell, it's like waves of night carnivores coming on everywhere this is absolute nightmare so it comes back over to guard turn two and i'm like right well i need to not be move blocked by this rhino and stuff so that's just gonna have to die so the shadow sword just stays still so it can just sit there and just destroy what it needs to destroy the ogren actually come over one of the ogren cameos comes over and prepares to start Going for one of those objectives in the north. I feel like the Ogren can move over there. We can do something. And then in the south, the other Ogren squad jumps out of the Chimera before it moves. And they set themselves up in a position where they're going to be able to kill like the one or two Plague Marines that are just sat on that southern objective. When it comes to shooting, the Baneblade and the Katachans and the Ogren are able to kill the injured night carnival the one that i've been bumming around the place since turn one and they also kill the bloat drone the, the bane blade it went it went it went ham 
to be honest. All of the little stuff, well, I say little stuff, all of the Laz cannons and the heavy bolts went to the Night Carnivore and stripped it down. And then the Demolisher cannon and the Baneblade cannon, the Auto cannon went to the Bloat drone. And I didn't even need to fire anything but the Baneblade cannon. It just got some like 15 shots and just blew the Bloat drone. Send it back into the abyss from whence it came. The Ogres then charged him and... For once in their lives, I've used Ogren for so many editions, since like 8th eight, edition, ninth edition, 10th edition, for, for years I've been using these Ogren. And they always hit well, and then they flub the wounds. And for once, they just hit well, they wounded well, Chaos Space Marines, they're dead, they're gone, can they go now? Yes, they're gone. So I was able to secure that southern um, flank, which was good. But there was a night carnivore sort of bumming around there, giving me a bit of a hard time. But I couldn't see it, unfortunately. So there you go. But I'd killed one night carnivore. I killed the bloat drone. I killed the marines. There was a unit of Ogrenverse that was staying down a night carnivore, not looking so healthy. But hey, you know, it's not the end of the world. At least I've taken that objective off. Well, that's the big thing. In the center. There was no more activity. My guys just sat on the objective. That's fine. In the north, I Laz Cannon, Heavy Bolter, and Daka Chimera down the Rhino. That just dies. And then the Volcano Cannon goes off. Oh, baby. I don't call it a Titan Killer for nothing. Volcano Cannon just... I think it only gets like two shots, but it just hits with both. And then it wounds with both. And one of those wounds is a six. So it's a devastating wound. And the Night Carnivore just goes poof. Naught but a moat of dust floating on the wind. And so that was the northern flank cleared, but not done. Because you had the Plague Rings that were still on the objective. I then pass the baton back to Will, and he has a big old think. Because it's turn three, and the only model he's killed for my army is the Rogal Dawn. It's a good kill, but in return, he has lost two Night Carnivores, two Rhinos, a Bloat Drone, and ten Plague Marines. That's not a good trade. He's running out of units quickly. He's got to start hurting me, otherwise I'm going to continue to punish him. So turn three is the big Death Guard showdown, the hot tamale. The Predators decide to come out and they're going to have a Barney at the Shadow Sword. He's seen what the damage it can do and he needs to make sure it doesn't keep rocking around doing that. Mortarion and his little apprentice, the remaining Bloat Drone and the Nurglings go into the center. They want to clear out Strachan. Unfortunately, Old Iron Hand for the first game in a long time, dies without killing an enemy. Really sad. I was, it was the wasn't his fault. He did a good job. He still scored me five points, but I was kind of hoping that he'd live and then he'd like take more time out somehow. But it wasn't to be, sadly. But Strachan did get me some primary points, and that on its own is worth it in my book. In the south. The Ogrins learnt what a Night Carnivore can do in combat. And they went to the big farm that's really far away that we can't visit. The Catachans from the centre did get reincarnated with the uh, reinforced stratagem. And then we get to the Predators. Now they had very easily dealt with a Rogal Dawn. So they were confident that they could deal with a Shadow Sword. They learned the price of their hubris, their arrogance. After everything, Laz cannons, bolters, auto cannons, hunter killers, I think, havoc launchers, you name it. Everything that the predators, the dark gods, the kitchen sink could throw at the Shadow Sword. Once the smoke had cleared, because naturally I popped smoke. It had taken five wounds. That's not enough. 
that's nowhere near enough. To cap it off, Mortarion and the Bloat Drone, whilst they had uh, cleared the infantry in the centre, their combined OC was only something like 8 on the middle objective. So when it comes over to my turn, the Bane Blade is also OCA. I go, right, command phase, I'm going to order the Bane Blade to do duty and honour. So now it's OC 9, because I can do that with the Lord Solar. And that objective remains in my control. Very tasty. I then draw. I get a weird term for the Bane Blade, I'm not gonna lie. I then draw a card and it's cleanse. And the only guy that could cleanse in the middle was the Bane Blade. So the Bane Blade spends a turn just cleansing the middle objective. Brilliant. But it doesn't matter because it gets me points and it helps me. Uh, I couldn't, it was the only unit that I could cleanse with out of everything. I couldn't get onto the southern objective, couldn't get onto the northern objective. So the Bane Blade cleanses, which is funny, and then I get Bring It Down. And the Predators just expose themselves. Shadow Sword introduces the Predators to the meaning of anti tank. They thought that the Shadow Sword was trapped in here with them. It was not the case. They were trapped in the arena with the Shadow Sword. Volcano Cannon casually picks up one of the Predators without even breaking a sweat. And the Laz Cannons and Heavy Bolters pick up the other one, allowing me to get a big old max score on Bring It Down. Turn four rolls around and it becomes obvious that it's going to be the last turn of the game. There's just a few minutes left and we need to make sure that both players have enough time to get their turn four in. Mortarion and the Bloat Drone wail on the Bane Blade, but they don't kill it. It manages to live on just enough wounds that once the Tech Priest has repaired it, it can continue to control that central objective. Very good for me. In the north, the Plague Marines burn the objective. They started at turn three. I hadn't been able to stop them, so they complete it. That was significant because it did give Will five extra victory points. And then in the south, the Carnivore just sat on the objective. I didn't really have anything that could get over there and stop it. Comes over to my turn four. And... Will's ahead by a few points. And I need to do something. Anything. And I pull Area Denial and Assassination. Now there is only one character on the board. That is Mortarion. So I have to kill Mortarion and the bloat drone. I debate leaving the Bane Blade in combat because then it would still be able to like fire, but I make the difficult decision to fall back to a point where I still control the objective with duty and honor. And I leave it up to the Shadow Sword to get the job done. He rolls forward and I go, you know what? I'm gonna put the volcano cannon and two of the last cannons into Mortarium. And then I'm going to put two last cannons and all of the heavy bolters into the bloat drone. I go after the bloat drone first. It had taken some damage from being run over by the Bane Blade. And so the heavy bolters managed to chip off most of its wounds. And then a cheeky last cannon hit managed to sneak past. The demons say the demonic energy is not able to withstand the righteous fury of the emperor and it goes and it dies. Then we get to Volcano Cannon. I have to kill Mortarium. If I don't, I lose the game. Straight up. 36 damage later, Mortarion is naught but a puddle of goo on the floor. I roll four shots, they all hit, and when I roll to wound, I get three sixes. Devastating wounds, Mortarion can't do anything about it. Take that, you demonic son of a bitch! 
Go back to the Eye of Terror. Squat in the fetid muck that is Nurgle's Garden and cry like a bitch to your daddy. Yes! Shadow Sword single-handedly stopped me from losing the game. Now, because we are playing WTC points, which means that you have to win by more than five points in order to get the victory, it actually ends up being a really close game. And Will and I are within two points of each other. I can't remember who quite had the advantage. One of us had 71 points. One of us had 69 points. Nice. But it is a draw. And if the Shadow Sword had not killed those two units, it would have been a big loss for me. Big, big loss. So Shadow Sword coming in there. And it just... It was snap and necks. It was cash and checks all game. Whatever I pointed at, it destroyed. I mean, I know first turn, it's not much about home about that it killed a Rhino. But then second turn, taking out a Rhino and a Knight and then popping two Predators. It just consistently was just popping two units a turn. And this, as it would turn out, was not a fluke. As we shall discover, we enter into game number two. In the second battle of the day, I would come across a tournament favorite. A faction which you are guaranteed to bump into if you decide to hit the competitive scene. I am, of course, talking about the pointy ears, the knife ears, the perfidious Eldar. My opponent for game number two was Jason, and he was actually a great guy. He's one of those few people that I know who can hold their head up high and say that they are an old school Eldar player. And he had a lot of the metal infantry to prove it. In fact, all of his Fire Dragons and his Fire Dragon Phoenix Lord were the OG metal variant. So that was very, very cool to see. Overall, his force consisted of a Farseer Skyrunner with Weeping Stones upgrade. Fugan, who is the Phoenix Lord of the Fire Dragons, and who I am probably massively mispronouncing and butchering his name. All of you Eldar players out there, you may lambast me down the comment section, but please understand, I am but a simple ogre-brained monkey. Then we've got a Spirit Seer with Fate's Messenger, a unit of Fire Dragons, two Fire Prisms, two War Walkers, Wraith Guard, two Wraith Lords, a Viper, two squads of Dire Avengers, two squads of Shroud Runners and a squad of Wind Rider Jet Bikers. The mission for this particular engagement between his Imperial Guard and the Vile Xenos was Supply Drop. This is where there are five objectives, one in each player's deployment zone, three in no man's land. Over the course of turn four and turn five, one of the objectives in no man's land disappears each time until you get to turn five and there is just one objective left in no man's land, which is worth an absolute buttload of points. It is known as the Omega Objective. As for the deployment, it was Dawn of War, the classic, the traditional way of getting your forces on the tabletop and personally, my favourite. We then had for the mission rule, the twist as it were, Vox Static. In this mission, the command reroll stratagem and, almost more importantly, the new order stratagem both cost 2 CP to use. The Eldar deployed their army into three distinct battle groups. Over on the left hand side, this is all going to be from the guard perspective, we had the Wraith Guard which was supported by a Fire Prism and a unit of Scout Bikers. We then had in the middle a unit of Dire Avengers holding the home objective, the War Walkers and also the Wraith Lords. Over on the right flank, we had a, another, another unit of Dire Avengers, another unit of Scout Bikers, and another Fire Prism. As for the Emperor's true finest, I put the Shadow Sword out on the left flank, although it was behind some line of sight blocking terrain, and that was supported by Strachan and his Katachan mob. We then had in the center the Bane Blade, and that was supported by both of the Ogren Chimeras. And then over on the right flank, kind of exposed, but just 
being a bit of a lone wolf this game, we had the Rogal Dawn. Although I did support it with one of the Tech Priest engines here, with the second Tech Priest engines here going with the Bane Blade because he didn't have much cover to hide behind and I figured he'd probably want that 4% vulnerable save. We then roll off for first turn, and despite the guiding hand of the Emperor watching over us, the Trixie Elder were able to seize the initiative and get the first turn. And they went balls deep. They went hard. They went aggressive turn one. Over on the left flank, the Wraith Guard with the Spirits here move forward and start getting into a position to threaten the objective on that side. The Scout Bikers zoom forward between their move and their Scout move and they actually move block my Shadow Sword just a little bit. They are able to see the Catachans that are also hiding behind the Ruin but because Strachan is physically hidden by the bulk of the Shadow Sword, they can't see him. So sadly for them, and very happily for me, they can't pick him out of the unit because that would have made me very sad, losing Strachan again to basically nothing. In the middle, they push all of their Wraith Lords and their War Walkers into the middle. Just straight forward, they're like, we're going to put these four relatively drawable units because they've got invulnerable saves and they're all mass one to wound there's all sorts of shenanigans going on between those four particular constructs and so he thinks they can move on to the middle and start just locking that down because it turns out that as always seems to be the case of supply drop the middle objective was the one that was going to be around at the end so that's where we really wanted to fight over over on the right flank, it's a little bit more conservative. He takes a, a unit of five Dire Avengers and pushes them onto the objective between moving and advancing and whatnot. And he does that, even though he knows they're going to die, he does that because it scores him some points. I believe he got um, secure No Man's Land. So that's why he wanted to push those over there. And he also moves a unit of Scout Bikers uh, that's on the right flank and he moves them from one Ruin to the next Ruin. I should also mention that his Fire Dragons and Wind Riders moved towards the center, but they were a bit behind the War Walkers and the Wraith Lords, setting themselves up as a turn two counterpunch to whatever nastiness I was able to pull out of the bag in my turn one. But the big deal was he didn't expose his Fire Prisms. This was a bit of a double-edged sword, because on the one hand, it meant that I couldn't target them in my turn one which is obviously good because he doesn't want to lose his two biggest anti-tank assets when I'm running lots of big tanks. But on the other hand, he had gone all in with the vast majority of his army. And so looking back on this, at the time I thought, oh, that's a really smart move. But looking back on this, benefit of hindsight, I'm thinking if you're going to go all in, maybe leaving your two biggest punchers, your two biggest hitters back... That might not have been a good idea. That might have been a little bit of a mistake. But at the time, I genuinely thought, oh, damn, I was really hoping he'd move out with those so I could swap them aside. Maybe it was a catch-22. Maybe it was a rock-and-a-hard-play situation for the Eldar. But then the shooting begins. And the scout bikers kill a couple of Catachans. And that's basically it on the left flank. But really, the star of the show here is the center. Nine Bright Lances and supporting Shuriken other weapons come flying out into my Bane Blade. I get cover against some, not against others, but the end result is that the Bane Blade is left standing on about 12 or 13 wounds. It's just about cut down to half. And the big reason why that thing didn't go down was because of it being Toughness 13. Those Bright Lances really struggled to penetrate the thick iron hide of the Bane Blade. And when you need fives to wound, sometimes they come up, sometimes they don't. And even with the Cheeky Fate dice here and there, and with Eldar rerolls all over the place, bet just between the difficulty of wounding and the fact that in cover, my Bane Blade is going to get like a 4 plus save, means that not many Bright Lances go through. And the ones that do, do end up doing a decent amount of damage, but the Bane Blade is left standing. And this was a really big deal, because the Eldar had kind of gone all in on the understanding, on the expectation that one Bane Blade, the Shadow Sword, was going to be movement blocked, and the other one was going to be dead. And so by the time I was able to clear through the movement blockers and try and redirect some forces towards the middle, they would be comfortably on it. 
But that's not happened. That's not happened at all. And so my Bane Blade proceeds to move towards the middle of the board. And it's supported by its Tech Priest, which heals it up to 15 wounds and puts the 4 person Vulnerable save on it. The Rogal Dawn pops out from behind the rune on the right hand flank and drives towards the objective held by the Dire Avengers. And the Shadow Sword is able to move just within one inch, just outside of one inch of the Wind Riders, not Wind Riders, the Scout Bikers, the Ranger ones. And it's able to poke its barrel around the corner. And by doing this, it's able to see one of the Wraith Lords. Now, I gave my opponent, Jason, the chance to try and wiggle the model and twist it because he was trying to hide it behind one of the ruins. And I said, look, your intention is to try and hide behind it. I can move to see you from the edge of my barrel. So please take every effort you can. If you've got a bit of extra movement, you can do. And he does try and we wiggle around. We spend a couple of minutes trying to get it to work. But unfortunately, I can either see the majority of his sword that's sticking out or I can see the majority of one of the capes that's coming off it or I can see the edge of the base just not quite enough wiggle room for him to be able to hide that quite large model so what ends up happening is his movement blocking wasn't as effective as he wanted it to be those scout bikes just get pulverized by all of the heavy bolters and las cannons on the shadow sword and the main shadow sword cannon because at this point I kind of knew that the Shadow Sword Cannon didn't need support from the Laz Cannons. The Shadow Sword Cannon just... Oh, it's beautiful. It just gets two shots, two hits, and then on the wounds, it rolls a six, and it just obliterates the Wraith Lord. <laughs> oh, baby! Everything it looks at, it destroys! So the Shadow Sword continued its tradition of killing two units a turn, this time a unit of bikers and a Wraith Lord. It's completely cored. There wasn't even any Wraith Stones left for the Eldar to recover. And then the Catachans, who are also on the left-hand flank, move and move, move, move out behind their ruins. So they go nine inches forward. They swathe the Wraith Guard in holy fire. They burn it with the old flamers. Give them the beans, lads! And between that and the last guns, they're able to chip a wound off. And then they go charging into the Wraith Guard. The rifle butts and Kachan fangs of the regular troopers are able to bring down one of the constructs. And then Strachan, with his bionic arm and Devil's Claw, the million credit man, just punches the head of two Wraith Guard. Basically making them combat ineffective, reducing them down from a five-man squad to a two-man squad. Sure, the Spirit Seer is there who can bring one back, but that's all right. They're tied up in combat. They're not going to be anywhere near as effective. And next turn, I'm hoping that we'll be able to finish the job. On the right-hand flank, the Rogal Dawn pops out and says hello. Starts making his way towards the objective held by the Dire Avengers. The Dire Avengers get turned into red paste by the Dawn and I'm not quite able to get onto the objective myself but at least that one now is basically not held by anyone. But the main story is in the centre. Now my initial idea had been to drive the Bane Blade forward and kill the War Walkers but I realised that the bigger threat was actually psychic powers that things like the Farseer can do. I mean I, I just know that you got to kill the Eldar Psychers as quickly as you can. And I don't want him manipulating fate dice or any crazy stuff like that. So what I end up doing is actually driving my Bane Blade forward. And it's able to not quite get onto the objective, but it's near to the objective. I then put a lot of my firepower into the bikers that are behind the second wave. And I'm able to just blow them away completely. The, all the wind riders, about six of them in the squad, they all go down. And then I'm able to damage one of the war walkers, but that's about it. I do split fire a little bit too much and I try and send some shots after the Viper, but I'm not able to do any damage to it. It just gets lucky on it, saves. Then the Bane Blade charges the war walkers because they're on the objective. And so I've got OC8, they've got OC4. I charge in and. Sure, no one does any damage to each other, but that's okay because 
I just want to hold the objective and his war walkers now have got the difficult choice of staying in combat and being minus one to hit when shooting the bane blade or any units that try and help them out are going to be minus one to hit or they've got to fall back at which point they can't shoot and at which point he gives up any sort of units any presence on the mid board objective which remember is the one that's the most important at the end of the game we go into round two and the Eldar might have taken the bloody nose, but they certainly aren't out of it yet. I have exposed a lot of my army, and they have the chance now to counterpunch with things like Fire Dragons and Fire Prisms, premier anti-tank units, at least on paper. The Wraith Guard fall back from the fight with the Catachans and use Feigned Retreat to shoot into the Shadow Sword, but they're only able to do about five damage to it taking it down to 19 wounds this was with one of them regrowing with the spirit seer the wraith lord that had been going towards the center actually diverts and between its flamers and its choppy choppy and some other spare firepower they're able to kill the catachans down to just one man and strachan that was actually slightly frustrating i kind of wish they'd killed one more just so that then i could use reinforcements but i guess i'll have to wait a turn before i can do that in the center the fire dragons line up to get a big old shot on the bane blade the war walkers make the difficult decision to fall back but between the fire dragons and the viper with his bright lands my opponent is confident that he'll be able to pick it up and then we get over to the fire prisms and they decide to go after the rogal dawn this wasn't a bad choice at all because it's the only thing i've got over there and if it just gets a squat on an objective, slinging a presser cannon rounds out left, right and center, my opponent is going to regret it. So he uses linked fire and he fires both of his fire prisms at my Rogal Dawn. But here's the thing. Any of you who watched my recent Eldar vs. Guard battle report will know that Rogal Dawns are weirdly durable against fire prisms. And that's because of a plate of plating. So the fact that my opponent is able to get or hits three wounds onto the dawn and then what happens is i have my four percent vulnerable save i just blank one of the shots and then i fail one save past the other save and suddenly two fire prisms haven't poured and completely turned my rogal dawn to slag all they've done is knock six wounds off it and it's got 12 left that was not the result my opponent wanted and it only went downhill from there between the right lands of the viper bouncing off the bane blade once again and then the fire dragons just not been able to get through it i think my opponent just overestimated what they could do i overestimated what they could do every other edition i've ever seen fire dragons shoot anything that even remotely resembles a vehicle it disappears not this time, just again couldn't get past the 4 plus invulnerable save. I have to admit, I did get kind of lucky on the 4 pluses. But once the dust had settled, I don't think I took any damage on the Bane Blade. It was something in, something crazy. And then we go over to the left hand flank, which we've already described, where Shadow Sword took a bit of a tickling, but apart from that, that was it. So my opponent takes a step back, looks what he's done turn two, and he's still failed to completely wipe out a unit. Sure, the Catachans are almost gone, but the three big tanks are ready to rock and roll, and every single one of them can now see all of his important bits in his army. And sadly for my opponent, turn two is where he loses the game. Because his turn one and turn two, he's just bounced, and my turn to the Shadow Sword picks up the other Wraith Lord and the remaining Wraith Guard and also takes out the Viper. The Bane Blade completely destroys both War Walkers just between all of the firepower. And I think I charge it and finish one off that's on like a wound. And the Fire Dragons get obliterated by an Ogryn Daka Chimera squad. The Chimera drives forward, guns half down, the Ogryns jump out and just gun down the remaining half. And I think there was a Farseer knocking around as well, who the Ogryns then charge into combat with and kill. 
Fugan is left alive, but not for long, unfortunately. And so by the end of turn two, my opponent has lost everything in his army. But two Fire Prisms, one Fugan, and one unit of Dire Avengers. That's it. Turn three, he makes a good go at trying to kill one of my Bane Blades, and he with the Fire Prisms, he does get it down to about four wounds, but he doesn't quite kill it, unfortunately, between the repairing and whatnot. And I think at this point, I had enough CP for Armored Might, so I just if it reduced damage, it, it survives just about. And then my turn three, I blow up both of the Fire Prisms. Bugan dies to Strachan in single combat, which was cool. But then he gets back up again. But then he dies again. <laughs> Not in the same turn, obviously. He dies in about turn four. And at the end of turn four, my opponent is completely tabled. We get to the end and we toss up the points and the final score is 20 nil to the Imperial Guard. Victory is assured. Looking back on it now, I feel like perhaps the Eldar tried to meet the Guard on too broad a front and they didn't take advantage of their own strengths, which is force concentration. On paper, there was more than enough anti-tank to delete one of those vehicles a turn but they never quite managed it. And by spreading their firepower out, they never had quite enough to get themselves over the line. And every time they got close, the tech priest would start healing it up, 4% of the level would go off and would just get that little bit further away from them. If you're an Eldar player and you encounter a list like this, I would strongly advise that you concentrate on one asset at a time, completely eradicate it, then move on to the next. By the time you get to the end of the game, your opponent's forces will be in tatters and you'll probably still be relatively intact because they've been unable to get the firepower back at you thanks to your fantastic speed. But hindsight is all well and good, but we will not dwell on the past much longer. Now we must push on to the future. I don't think this analogy quite works because we're still talking about the past. But anyway, moving on, moving on. We get to game number three and the last game of the day. And once more, we enter into the maelstrom of war. We enter into the arena of battle. It is the ultimate showdown of ultimate destiny because I have somehow managed to claw my way up to the dizzying heights of table one. If I'm able to win this game, then I am able to to win the tournament. But standing between me and this most honorable goal is my final round opponent, a fantastic guy called Paul. He had a very spicy list. It was all Black Templars, and he chose the Vow that gave him the six plus feel no pain. And then he had a Repulsor with the big laser destructor cannon, another Repulsor with the big plasma cannon on it. He then had two Ballistus Dreadnoughts and two Redemptor Dreadnoughts. And then there was a unit of Interceptors with Bolters, a unit of Interceptors with Plasma, and then a big 10 man squad of terminators with a terminator ancient and i think there was a tech marine knocking around the place as well the mission this time was going to be vital ground if you hold your objective marker you gain 2vp one in no man's land you gain five and if you somehow manage to get your opponents you will gain six victory points the deployment was sweeping engagement and the twist, the mission rule, was minefields. As for our actual deployment, Paul puts down his big unit of Terminators behind the ruins in the top left. Again, all this from the guard perspective, which will allow him to comfortably sit on one of the objectives with the big block of dudes. And then he puts the rest of his armor well hidden in his deployment zone behind all of the ruins. There's no way that I'm going to be able to see any of it turn one. Then it comes over to my deployment and I put the Chimera with the Ogrins and Strachan squad on my right hand flank. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to go over there. I'm going to hold that objective down. I'm just going to mirror him with his Terminators. We then, in the center, have my Baneblade and the other Chimera Ogryn squad. 
And then on the left-hand flank, as is tradition now, in the position of honour, we had the Shadow Sword hidden out of line of sight. With my Command Blob, of course, going in the ruin that was near the Shadow Sword so that it could reach out and do all of the various orders. The Rogal Dawn was in a position where it was hiding behind the ruin in sort of the middle south, the back end of my deployment zone behind the Bane Blade. We then get to the dice roll for first turn and unfortunately once again every single time this tournament I go second and I really didn't want to go second. I would quite have liked to be able to go first so I can start maneuvering things and start getting myself up the board, getting some fire angles off, you know, maybe I could have made something happen with my Shadow Sword, it's got a long barrel, you know, like there was things that could have happened, but I don't get it. And I go, well, it's not in the world. What I'll do is I'll use my Lord Souls redeployed to move my Bane Blade from where it is right now, stuck out in the open, and I'll move it over to the flank where the Shadow Sword is. And my opponent informs me, well, actually, that happens before we roll the dice to see who gets first turn. And the moment he says it, I just realise he's right. It had been my intention to move the vehicle, but I was getting 9th edition and 10th edition mixed up. Now, I know that Paul is a really nice guy, and I know that he would have let me off, and he would have let me move my Bane Blade if I'd gone, mate, it was totally my intention to do that. I would not have set my Bane Blade up in the middle, wiggling its bum at you in front of all of your anti-tank if I'd known I couldn't redeploy it. Like, I just got the sequence mixed up. But, I don't ask him to let me off. And the reason I don't ask him to let me off is because we're on top table, and we are playing to win the event, and there is prize support at stake. And so when you get to this situation, you're playing on top table, you kind of have to wear your mistakes. And so sadly, all of the anti-tank comes out of the woodwork and Paul's first turn consists of him sending my Bane Blade to dine by the Emperor's table. It's not an easy one. And if he didn't have old school Oath of Moment, he definitely wouldn't have achieved it. But thanks to Oath of Moment, he is able to just to the very last wound, get the damage over the line and destroy the Baneblade turn one, which is a big blow to my army. And it wasn't it was wasn't even necessary if I just Paid attention, switched my brain on, and played properly, that Bane Blade would have lived. But thanks to my carelessness and my mistakes, unfortunately, I took a big hit at the beginning of the game. But do not despair, my little conscripts, for in a strange sort of way, the Bane Blade is the most disposable tank in this army. The Rogal Dawn is a lot more manoeuvrable, and thanks to its oppressor cannon being more reliable than the swingy casino cannon of the Bane Blade, it's often feels like it's a better vehicle. You then have the fact that the Shadow Sword is obviously the superior creation at this point, and the Chimeras, whilst cheap and you would think disposable, provide vital maneuverability to the army. I had lost a big chunk of firepower, but even with the Bane Blade gone, I still had plenty of firepower. In fact, my second game opponent, who was stood next to me playing his own game at this point, was friends with my third game opponent, Jason and Paul knew each other, and Jason said, you've killed the wrong Bane Blade there. And Paul's like, no, no, it's good. It's a Bane Blade. It's important. He went, no, no. Trust me, you've killed the wrong Bane Blade. And oh, how prophetic Jason's words were to be. Well, I decided to introduce the Black Templars to the true meaning of anti-tank firepower. In my turn one, Strachan and the Ogren move on to the southern objective on the right-hand side. I don't really have much that can move on to the northern objective, but I take the other Chimera and I sort of put it behind the L-shaped ruin so that I've got a position where the Ogren can jump out and maybe make some things happen. The Shadow Sword moves forward so that it can get a line of sight from the Tifferitz barrel on both the Repulsor with the big laser cannon and the Ballista's Dreadnought. And the Rogal Dawn sets up so it can see both of those targets as well. I decide to open up with the big gun to make a statement, as it were. 24 damage later, the Volcano Cannon has completely and utterly obliterated the Repulsor with the Laser Cannon. That is the true meaning of Dakar. Then between the last cannons and heavy bolters of the Shadow Sword and the Oppressor Cannon of the Rogal Dawn, the Ballista's Dreadnought is also 
sent back into the abyss. I may have lost a third of my armor, but my opponent just lost a third of his. And the tanks that he lost are way more anti-tank than the tank that I lost. It goes over to my opponent's turn two, and he suddenly realizes that he doesn't actually have more firepower than me. Because there's nothing in his army now that realistically takes down that Shadow Sword man to man. Sure, he's got a Laz Cannon and some crack rockets from a Brutalis Dreadnought, and there's like a Plasma Repulsor floating around and a couple of Redemptors of Plasma Cannons, but that's a lot of weapons that are going to need to wound on fives versus the Shadow Sword. And now it's got its 4% Vulnerable save up, and so does the Rogal Dawn. So neither of these tanks are anywhere near as fragile as they were on turn one, and he doesn't have anywhere near the firepower that he had. As a result... My opponent decides to go into Operation KG and he hides his repulsor with the plasma cannon behind his home ruin and he moves his two remaining Redemptor Dreadnoughts into the middle and tries to hide them and the Brutalis Dreadnought he moves to a point where he doesn't think I'll be able to get the angle on it, it goes as far as it can go. So he's tried to hide everything and let me tell you, look, whatever happens at this point, from this point on in the game, I'm claiming the moral victory. Because the fact that in a single volley, the Shadow Sword was able to make a Space Marine armored company scatter to the wind. I'm taking that one to the bank, boys. But be assured, this was not cowardice on the part of Paul. This was very much tactics and strategy. And whilst I can stroke my ego with the fact that I was able to kill things, we can't get away from the fact that he was setting himself up to score a lot of points. And in the first two or three turns, he does massively pull ahead on the points. I'm able to keep up just about on primary here and there, but my secondaries really aren't coming up much in the first two turns. Turn three is not so bad, but it's not great. My turn, but we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves. My turn two, I'm able to actually get an angle on that Brutalis Dreadnought that he thought he'd hidden. The Shadow Sword's barrel's so long and it goes like nine inches. And so I'm just like, you know what? It's fine. I'll just move forward. And from the tip of my bow, I can see the Batara Dreadnoughts. Nothing you can do about it. And one volcano cannon later. And the Batara Dreadnought is a smoldering pair of feet stood on a rather disheveled looking base. There is nothing left for them to even bury. That brother is not getting put back into another sarcophagus. He is definitely gone. Battle round three, and my opponent continues to play it KG. He exposes one of his Redemptors to go after a Chimera, but isn't able to destroy it. But he also goes on to an objective and starts to contest it, because his Redemptors are like OC5, and I've only got two Catachans that are just towing onto it from behind the ruin, so I'm not quite able to control that one, which is a bit of a shame. And then... He brings his jumpy dudes down. Now he brings one set of them down behind the room where his terminators are in the top left. That indicates to me that turn four, turn five, he's going to start making moves with those terminators. He's not quite ready to do it yet, but he wants to make sure he's got that objective locked down. And he also brings a unit of jumpy dudes down in my deployment zone because they can go three inches away. The Lord Solar squad isn't able to screen them out. But fortunately, rather than going after my command squad, he uses them to get himself deployed teleporter Homer. Now, at turn three, my opponent has got a decent lead on the points. And my turn three cards are all right, but it's looking like I'm just not going to be able to do much on the point front. And I'm doing lots of damage to him, but he's just going to win on points in the end. And unfortunately... Turn three is a sad turn because the Shadow Sword, after two games, two and a half games of just never missing a beat, finally stumbles. It doesn't even have to move and it's able to see the Redemptor Dreadnought that exposed itself. It gets four shots on its big gun and it misses every single one of them. Now, I just want you to remember that, okay? The Shadow Sword missed every single shot. 
this is going to become relevant later on. So sadly, the Redemptor, it takes a few shots from the Laz Cannons and from the Heavy Bolters, and it does end up going down to about like seven or eight wounds by the time I'm done. But the Volcano Cannon just... Maybe the barrel was getting hot, you know, maybe it needed a barrel change, but sadly it did not get the hits that it needed. And so my turn three, I do no damage, it's a complete whiffer. I move my Rogal Dawn from the center over to the left flank because I want to try and start using it to get some angles and where it is right now, it's just not able to do very much. It was a little bit of an impulsive decision and unfortunately I was punished for it because Turn four comes around and my opponent gets to bring it down. And my Rogal Dawn is unfortunately now not near, but near-ish where his Terminator Blob is hiding. And they jump out. I overwatch them with the Rogal Dawn. I'm able to kill one of them, but it's not enough. And they get a nine-inch charge with a reroll on the Rogal Dawn and they are able to destroy it even with the blank and everything I think there was some supporting fire from the Redemptor that lived that took some wounds off me and then they were just able to kill it I think it was the devastating wounds from the Thunder Hammers that just wrecked me so that got my opponent some points and now I've lost another big tank I'm down to just the Shadow Sword this has not happened before I've never been down to just one of the big tanks in any game this was a real fight but both of my tech boost entrances had been within 12 inches of the Rogal Dawn when it died. And so both of them were very, very angry that a vehicle had been destroyed. Comes over to my turn. My Shadow Sword stays still again. And I'm like, right, I've got the Lord Solar Command Blob. I've got a unit Ogrins and I've got two very angry tech priests. I'm going to try and use their firepower to weaken up the big blob of terminators first and then i'll support that with some firepower from like a chimera and the little stuff from the little stuff the heavy bolters and the large cannons from the um shadow sword and then the volcano cannon can have one more crack at going at the redemptor so i fire all of this stuff into the terminators and i bring them down to about it was about three and the ancient it was below half strength. And then I fire the Volcano Cannon. And I only get two shots. But I'm like, you know what? Two shots is all I need. And I get two misses. And the Volcano Cannon missteps. It stumbles last turn. And it falls over onto its face this turn. Two turns in a row. This vehicle has gone from being the un unprecedented undisputed mass of the battlefield to just killing like a couple of terminators just next to nothing it was just so tragic it was heartbreaking to watch but the line has not ended the show must go on Strachan and the boys burst forth from behind their ruin and they're able to charge down the enemy infantry that's like a unit of like five interceptors or inceptors or infiltrators. One of the Phobos Marines. I don't know what they're called. Strachan goes in there and he's able to uh, kill four out of five of them. One of them did uh, just about live through some lucky saves from the Katachan Fangs. Um, and then I charge in the remaining, all of my Command Blob, my Tech Priest, my Ogryn. I charge them into the Terminators. And thanks to the Tech Priests having six attacks each because they're very, very angry... And the fact that I've got orders to be able to give them fixed bayonets because my two big tanks are down now. I've got loads of orders flying around the place spare. I'm able to actually kill all of them apart from the ancient who lives on a wound. Now that covers the main actions of turn three and turn four. Apologies, I got slightly carried away with the fate of the Rogal Dawn. And you might be listening to this right now and be thinking, I feel like the guard are in a terrible spot. The Shadow Swords whiff, the points aren't going well. But actually the franchise has started to turn around because my turn four cars had been exquisite i've been able to get both of them for max points big old 10 and i've been able to secure myself some good primary points as well and 
Because of the shenanigans of Strachan, I've been able to reduce my opponent down to just one victory point, primary victory point, which meant that he only got two VP for that. His Inceptors that had been on guard duty where the Terminators had been had actually had the objective snuck away from them, but when my Scions dropped down, killed uh, one of them, and then charged in and managed to get 5 OC onto the objective versus their like 2 OC. So he goes into turn 5, my opponent scores like 2 victory points and on primary, and he draws his last 2 cards and he just can't achieve them. So he scored everything he's going to score. It comes over to my turn 5, and I draw, bring it down, and no prisoners. Now, no prisoners, I can get with the scions that are in the north by just nobbling those last two. That, that, there's, like, there's like one insect on like a wound, and I'm able to get Supreme Command Blob up there to help out as well. So that's no prisoners, just guaranteed. Nice. That's one point for it. And then he's got that lone infiltrator dude. And I get that as well. And that's that's two points for no prisoners. And then he's got like a Kalexus assassin that he'd like moved into the middle of the board. Because I think one of his objectives at one point had been like area denial. But he hadn't quite been able to get the full points for it. And so I get that as well. The Ogrins actually jump out of the chimera there's one set ogren squad that's left just doing it just chilling out and it's one of the ones that was involved in the big brawl with the uh, terminators and they move over hose the collects down and just the calendar sorry hose the cards down and just take off tables so that's three points for no prisons that's that's max no prisons just boom done on my turn five and then it comes down to bring it down and we look at the points and i'm behind by five now this is WTC scoring. So if I am behind by five points, I lose the game. If I'm able to get a single additional victory point, then I'm able to get a draw. If somehow I'm able to get 10, I'm able to get a win, but that's not gonna happen. Now I've scored all my prime, my primary's already locked in. I've got my 10, that's, that's, that's what I can get on that one. And I've got I've got my get like 12 on it because I've got two of the middle ones and I get the my home one. Whatever it is, well however the score ends, I'm five behind and I've got bring it down. And I've got a shadow sword. And I look at that redemptor that has mocked me for two turns. And I say No. I'm not gonna get tunnel vision onto that thing. It's cursed. It's completely cursed. That Redemptor has lived for two turns. By living for two turns, it has caused me all sorts of headaches. It has reduced down my infantry. It has been blown away. It's been getting my, my opponent like some points here and there. It's been an absolute nightmare. By living, it's gotten him probably about five or six victory points on its own. And has put him in the position to win. But it's earned that victory. It's earned... The right to live it has taken two blasphemy shadow sword and instead i take a little moment to think and rather than shooting the vehicle that's right in front of me look around and i see my opponent's repulsor now this repulsor was a big vehicle and it was a and it was worth five victory points. And remember, I needed those five to get the draw. And so what I did, is I fired my volcano cannon one last time. I got two shots. I get two hits, two threes. Roll to wound, and I get... My opponent uses Armor of Contempt. He's like, I need Armor of Contempt plus Cover to try and stop you. I roll to Wound. I roll double six. For devastating wounds for 24 damage. And the Repulsor is destroyed. It is no more. It has ceased 
to B, and in one foul swoop, the Shadow Sword redeems itself. It gets me five victory points, and the final score of the game is 73-73. Not only is it a draw by WTC scoring, but it's a bang-on draw by normal 40k standards as well. And lo, with that final shot, the game and the tournament came to an end. And once all the tabulating was done, once the BCP cogitators had done their thing, I ended up placing third. So I did podium with the crazy stream built meme list. Will, my game one opponent, actually ended up coming second. And Paul, my game three opponent, actually ended up coming first. So congratulations to both of them. And overall, I was really satisfied with the performance. I thought the list was going to do terribly because it was so different to anything that I had used. But it was a great example of how if you just focus on pure damage and pure firepower, you can win or draw most of your games in 40k. But our tale does not end there. You see, as I was walking back to my car with my army in hand, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. I stopped physically in the street and had to have a mental battle, a mental battle with myself to not scream into the air. Because I just remembered something. You remember in game three when I said that my Shadow Sword missed the two rounds? The Shadow Sword has a ballistic skill of four plus. When you give it take aim, it hits on three plus. This had been basically how I've been running it the whole event. But when the Shadow Sword stays still, it gets to benefit from the heavy rule. Heavy gives you plus one to hit. Take aim gives you plus one to your ballistic skill, which means that they stack. Which means that that turn, those turns, when the Shadow Sword missed all of its shots, it actually didn't miss any of them because it rolled a bunch of twos both times. And so that Redemptor would not have lived and the Redemptor after that also would not have lived. And so if I had remembered my rules, I probably would have won game number three. And I probably would have won the tournament. And kids, that is why you always read your rules. And that is why you always have practice games. Because if I had actually... Played a few more games with the Shadow Sword before I took it to the tournament. I guarantee you that would not have happened. But you know what? That's on me. I did not win that game number three because I didn't check the order for when you do redeploys. And I didn't remember that my Shadow Sword had heavy. And on that rather harsh yet important life lesson, we're going to bring today's video to a close. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please leave lots and lots of comments. Let me know what you thought. And also, give me an idea of what other armies you want to see me take to tournaments. Of course, I can take pretty much any kind of guard army. But I have other factions as well. So if you want to see a 150 Black Templar Black Tide hit the tournament scene, I can do that. I've also got a full Tyranid Horde army. I'm working on an Orc Green Tide. And... If you really want to punish me, you can make me take Tao to a tournament. If you had fun listening to this, then please consider smashing that like button. And if you want to see more after action reports like this, then make sure you subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or patron. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content 
for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patreons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patreons these are the war masters, the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty. So a massive thank you to Bon Bon Bert, Mad Larkin, Mark Panconi, RJ Scorpion, Swordfish Trombone, John Stubbs, Nick Walsh, Diesel Fox, August Vardy, and the Tommies. Thank you guys, your incredible support makes a huge difference and it is a big part of how I'm able to do Mordian Glory full time. But that's all for now, thank you for watching and of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.